About three and a half years ago, this columnist for the Pittsburgh newspaper wrote a column that said uh, black people should just get over slavery and that black people were better off than had they stayed in Africa. So that let me know two things. He didn't know any black people and he'd never been to Africa. I was upset by the idea that people still in America refuse to deal with the issue of the lingering impact of enslavement, what it did the continuation of discrimination and racism that we're still dealing with today. And I thought, you know, I, I need to say something, but it wasn't enough for me to just say something. I wanted to create a chorus of voices to say something, and that's why I did it. I called people I knew. My first call was to my friend Leonard Pitts. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist. He was working on his book. And I said, Leonard, will you do this? And he put his book down and said yes. And then I called Nicole Hannah-Jones, my friend, who is an investigative reporter for the New York Times. And I said, will you write the foreword for this book? And she said, I'm working on my book, but yes, I'll do it. So she put down what she was doing. And I called my friend Paula Madison, who traced her family history on the other side, her Chinese history, 5,000 years. And she is in the middle of you know, uh, a film and book tour because she has the book, Finding Samuel Lowe, but also has the documentary, Finding Samuel Lowe, so she's plenty busy, but she said she would participate, and on and on and on, and I got different people who all felt this was important enough to stop for a minute and take stock, and I'm ever grateful to them. Because it did not harm them. I, I think that people still try to take this personally, this is not a personal matter. When people use the word reparations, immediately walls go up and there's this whole you know, feeling that something is going to be taken from someone. What we're talking about is an institution of industrial labor that built America and it's never been set right. There's never been any effort to even acknowledge that it happened and that's the first thing that has to happen. I'm glad that Congress is going to take a minute to do a study, but I can help them study what happened. We each have stories in our own families about, you know, the, the ways that slavery continued to affect different generations through discrimination and racism. So we have to do something about it, um, or, or we will always be faced with this problem, and America ought to be bigger and better than that. I feel optimistic that a lot of the racists who truly, truly believe that they are superior to other people because of their color will die out. And that a lot of people who understand that we are a country of immigrants and a country of people who come from different cultures may have a different conversation. But I don't want it to take that long because I've got a nine-year-old grandson who I really want to live in a better world. Well. African Americans, the formerly enslaved and their descendants, have spent literally a century and a half seeking permission to be free, permission to vote, permission to live in certain places, permission to have certain jobs. We have to stop doing that, but America also has to stop carrying the burden of hiding this as if it didn't happen, of not dealing with it as if it doesn't affect our children who are in inferior schools or, you know, Quite frankly, people who want to do certain jobs uh, that are their dreams that they cannot do. As long as we live in a country where anybody is hindered by their race, we have that burden to put down. And that means it's not an individual thing. Nobody asked anybody to write a personal check. What we're talking about is repairing a broken system so that our country can be better. And we need to put that down. biggest thing that we're not talking about that's happening under Donald Trump in the presidency and in the White House is that he is turning back decades of progress that people have made. He is making it easy for people who hate to hate. He's empowering some people to hate. He is espousing hate himself. We have made a lot of progress in this country. Are we where we need to be? No, not yet. But are we going to get there if we have somebody who's doing that? No. He has become a roadblock. So I am hoping that if America really sees the America that it was on its way to being and wants to fight for it, that there will be some type of unison to do that. Well, 
I say this all the time. Um, if we taught children well and we weren't miseducating all of our children, then young black children would know how magnificent they are to, as a race, have come so far and achieved so much and invented so many things. And if little white children knew those same things, they would not look to black children and see someone inferior. And as long as we continue that miseducation, we're not going to change that. Um, but here's the thing. Black people built this country. The fact that we can love it should not be something that's surprising to anyone. But we'll, what we really want is for it to love us back. I, I would hope that it would continue to start conversations. The nearly 80 conversations I've had around the country have been great, but not enough. We have to have a national conversation. We have to have our own truth and reconciliation. And at some point, we have to realize that things will not get better until we make them better. It's not going to happen by sweeping anything under the rug or pretending like it didn't happen or saying things like, let's just move on. You can't move on from hate. You can't move on from a legacy that continues to make people uh, have to work harder uh, to pursue life, liberty, and justice. So we, we have to do something rather than wait for something. I actually uh, just turned in a book for young readers, young readers of all colors and backgrounds, called That They Lived, 20 African Americans Who Changed the World. And in this book, each essay, and it's a, it's a series of biographical essays, and each essay starts with what famous people were doing when they were 11, 12, and 13 years old. And they feature photographs from this amazing woman out of uh, Kent, Michigan, which is just outside of Seattle, uh, Kent, Washington, which is just outside of Seattle, Washington. Um, for uh, Black History Month, she dressed her four-year-old daughter, Lola, up as a famous uh, black woman. So there was a picture of Lola as that person, and then that person, they're striking. So I said, well, I don't want to leave boys out, so I flew up with my grandson, and she did the same thing with him. So seeing this young boy as W.E.B. Du Bois or Frederick Douglass, and he, Frederick Douglass was his favorite one because he liked the hair, and seeing Lola as Fannie Lou Hamer and Katherine Johnson, I'm hoping that it will move children to know that no matter where they are, what they do in life, every famous person, every person who was important was once a child.